Hello fellow submarine enthusiasts. My name is Hank Pronk and I want to show off my new submarine that I've spent three or four years working on. But first I want to talk about the four main criteria in designing this submarine. Number one, of course, is safety. I feel I built it to be extremely safe. I followed ABS guidelines on a lot of it. Other things I improvised, but I've got some really unique safety features here that I want to show you guys. And I'll show you that as I walk around and explain how everything is working. Secondly, it was really important to me to really test myself. And I wanted to build the deepest diving homemade submarine in the world. Mission accomplished. This submarine dives 3,000 feet. It'll be tested to 4,500 feet and the crush depth is over 5,000 feet. So it's a very solid and safe submarine. Number three is the size. That's a biggie for me. My last submarine that I just sold weighed 6,000 pounds. Fantastic submarine, but a real bugger to handle being so heavy and it was really long and barely fit in the shop with, with the trailer. So this submarine had to be under 12 feet and 3,000 pounds maximum. Again, mission accomplished. It's 10 foot six long, it's 3,000 pounds, pretty much on the nose, and it's six foot two wide. So I'm really quite pleased with the design criteria and how I've achieved that. So the first thing I wanna talk about here is the dome. I cannot express to you how proud I am of this dome. I made this dome from scratch. I researched how to do it properly. I followed all the PVO rules. I talked to a manufacturer who's a total expert in the field. He gave me guidance. I had to find an engineer to help me design the dome and I was lucky River Dolphy helped me free of charge. Plus he made some really nice drawings for me to follow. The second challenge I had was I needed an annealing oven with very precise temperature control to do the annealing cycles. A good friend of mine, Brian McIntosh, he helped me with that and he designed and, and built a control system that logged the data. And I could literally be at work, look on my phone and tell what the temperature in the oven was and if it matched the program. Fantastic. Without them, I couldn't have done it. So I bought a four inch thick block of acrylic from Reynolds Polymer. I built my own radius tool to cut the radius on my lathe. That was quite a challenge and I actually, I had to build it three times because I kept screwing up. It's actually pretty hard to build rigid enough and be able to move on the lathe to do this, but I, I, I accomplished it. Then we did this, the annealing cycle, then I machined it, then I polished it. The fit to the seat has to be within one quarter of a degree. And I achieved better than that. That translates to seven thousandths of an inch and I'm about two thousandths of an inch of misalignment. I think that's fantastic. So again, I'm very, very proud of this and it was probably the biggest challenge I faced in building this submarine or any submarine for that matter. So moving on to the occupant sphere, this sphere that I sit in is 50 inches outside diameter, so it's plenty big. It's one inch thick, 516-70 grade steel, which is pressure vessel steel. I had two hemispheres formed in Edmonton for me and they were custom bent within the required sphericity. That's the key here, obviously. So when the two halves arrived and all the other rings, of course, I welded the whole thing together myself. That was another thing that took a lot of research. I had to make sure that I had all the temperatures correct and the procedures correct. So the welding turned out perfect. And I know that because after I welded the entire sphere together, I cut the hole out to install this um, port seat. And so now I have a weld going right across here. So I cut this piece that I removed, I cut it into slices, and then I did coupon bend tests. The hull is rated for 3,000 feet, of course, same as the dome. The dome is 1.5 inches thick and rated for 3,000 feet. I have actually had the pressure sphere in a test chamber in Vancouver at Nutco Research. They were kind enough to help me with that. And we pressure tested it to 2,900 feet of fresh water. 
And again, that was in the chamber. And it sat in the chamber at that depth for one hour. No problems at all, no leakage, no anything. So I'm very comfortable with the sphere and let's move on to the arm. So obviously this is the arm that I built. Not nearly as challenging as the window, but still it takes some effort. It took me about two weeks to make this arm. It's powered with these guys right here. These are Lenco actuators. They're trim tab actuators from a boat. Really simple. They're not that expensive. And I modify them. I, I end up filling them with oil. So I drill in a vent hole and I drill in some oil passages so that the oil can go all over the place. Then, so these, these make the arm move, of course. And then there's a, a pressure bladder because when the cylinder moves in and out, the volume changes and that volume has to be taken out. So there's a pressure compensating bladder to do that. It's speed controlled and that's the key. And that's why you can make it so inexpensive. It is so precise because you can control the speed with such accuracy. I can pick up a banana and not leave a mark on it, which to me is pretty impressive for the cost of the arm. So let's move on to the next item. So this guy right here, this is like an underwater shop vac. We call it the sample sucker. And what we do is we take this nozzle and we put it into the hand from the arm and then we can move the arm all over the place on the bottom and we suck up the sediment, weeds, whatever. We do that so that scientists can analyze it and do whatever scientists do. Full disclosure, I did not make this. This was a gift to me from Craig Bussell in California and it's, I'm really grateful because it works fantastic. All of this is mounted on this aluminum chassis which is hinged. And that's because sometimes I'm a bit of a wild pilot and I run into things and I hit the bottom and whatnot. So this will help to protect it. So let's move on to the back of the sub. So a submarine of this nature with such a small occupant sphere has very small amount of volume, air volume. That means we have to add buoyancy to it just to make it stay on the surface. So right here on both sides is two huge carbon fiber tanks. They hold 3,600 PSI internal. So they serve two purposes. One is they provide over 500 pounds buoyancy per tank, plus they supply the air for blowing ballast. In the center here is a 100 gallon main ballast tank. And inside here is a solenoid valve inside an oil bladder to protect it from corrosion. Now we'll move on to some safety features. This, is my own personal invention. I don't know if anybody's done it, but I'm trying it. These motors are not jettisoning normally. So if they get caught in a fishing line or a rope or anything like that, I'm stuck on the bottom. So what I did, I mounted them on magnets. So these arms will just tear, or sorry, these motors will just tear away when they are tangled in something but the, the magnets are strong enough that the force of the thrust won't move them. I'm hoping it works well. Stay tuned, I guess. Now here's the big safety feature. The whole bottom half of this submarine can be jettisoned. So anything gets tangled in the arm, in the chassis, in the back thrusters, anywhere, I can drop the whole thing. All I have to do is send hydraulic fluid to two hydraulic cylinders and they release three latches and it's all gone. Batteries, everything is left behind. Now, the sub suddenly weighs 1,000 pounds less, so it simply shoots to the surface. So the last thing I want to talk about in terms of the, the build of the submarine is the body. This is pretty funny actually. I didn't want to spend three or four thousand dollars laying up a body on a mold, blah blah blah. I hate fiberglass. So what I did, I went onto Facebook, onto our local buy and sell group, and I asked for people to donate canopies, canoes, showers, bathtubs, whatever they have laying around for donor fiberglass. Small community, of course, everybody helped out. I had a whole bunch of canopies, showers, tubs, canoe, you name it. So what I did is I cut them all up into pieces that I needed to make this shape. So for instance, this is the top of a canopy that rolls over the front of the canopy and then the window would be here. So I took this section, cut it out, 
This is the identical section and I reversed it. I fiberglassed them together and that's how I made the whole body. So it cost two or $300 in fiberglass to glass all the pieces together. Saved a ton of time, saved a ton of money, and it looks pretty good. So now, where do we go with the submarine? So what's happening is, as soon as the ground thaws outside, I'm gonna dig another test pool beside the shop, line it with a pool liner, put a gantry crane above it, and start testing it in a controlled environment in a pool. It's mainly to get the balance right. I don't seem to have the math skills to predict that, so I just build it and then adjust to where it has to be. It seems to work fine for me. So once we have the pool testing done, hopefully the lake close by will be thawed and we'll do a 100 foot dive, make sure everything is A-OK. -okay. Then it's off to Slocan Lake for a 1000 foot unmanned test. I just sink it to the bottom. I have a little rope going down to it. I pull on the rope, it activates an air valve and it surfaces the submarine. I've done it a whole bunch of times. Once that's all done, and we'll start diving the submarine in Kootenai Lake this summer, and we're going to videotape a uh, steamboat uh, paddle wheeler that's completely intact and it, it hasn't been looked at in 20 years. Plus we're gonna look for this lost gold boulder just for the fun of it, because it's in the same basic area. While that's all happening and finished with, my son Anthony and I are going to build a two-man submarine and we're going to document every phase of the build, right down to the welds, every last nut and bolt is gonna be documented and we're gonna do a YouTube series. It'll probably take us a year. There will probably be a hundred videos, I don't know. But I've always wanted to document an entire submarine built, a build. And it'll be built mostly to ABS rules. So thanks for watching and hopefully we'll see you in the next video.